Welcome to this new edition of uh, another news from Underground. This time we're gonna well we're gonna skip ahead from the announcements as well. Happy New Year's Eve, tomorrow's New Year's, and hopefully there's uh I guess I don't really do I guess New Year's resolutions or anything like that. Do you guys ever do that? No. No. <laughs> uh, not really, because if I want to make a change in my life, I'm gonna do it when I want it now because it's the New Year, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do it now. Stop waiting around. That's another excuse. Well, I'll wait until next week. I'll wait till next Monday. I'll wait till it's five o'clock. I'll wait till it's New Year. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, <laughs> you only have enough time on this earth to start doing stuff. Time is yours. Uh, right. Time doesn't wait for you. Why uh, wait until tomorrow? What you can do today? <laughs> Absolutely. Stop running out of excuses and start doing what you need to do now. Uh, stop waiting for someone. That's always been like the Star Wars theme or a lot of the stuff. Waiting for someone to come into your life so you can start doing stuff. Or asking the question. Someone should do that. When you ask that question, you're looking at the person. It's you. Uh, so yeah, hopefully uh, you guys just kick, start getting the, the ball rolling on that. Uh, I guess we have a first story. Right, so first up is uh, pro prosecutors defend urging no charges in Tamir Rice shooting. Prosecutors who recommended bringing no charges against two officers in the shooting of Tamir Rice said they were required to reveal to a grand jury that they didn't think a conviction was possible. So um, this follows what seems to be a pattern of prosecutors really not uh, going after cops in cases with as much zeal as they generally go after most people. And uh, I think this, this, this kind of follows that pattern. Um, the, there was a claim by Tamir Rice's attorney, well, by attorneys for the Rice family that uh, what happened was the, the prosecutors actually um, bullied and, and uh, you know, harassed the, the grand jury into calling for no indictment here. And the claim is that the shooting was justified because Rice was quote unquote drawing his pellet gun. And the cops of course couldn't tell the difference. Now in their defense, playing devil's advocate, the pellet gun did look somewhat realistic, but I looked over some of the video and I don't think they've actually released the quote unquote enhanced video, which knowing how that works, I think a lot of people are getting the sense that this is like CSI where you say, okay, you know, enhance this and it shows it bright, you know, clear as day, mm -hmm. but that's not how digital video works. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty skeptical, but from what I saw, the only time Tamir Rice was drawing and shooting or, you know, pointing was way before the cops even showed up. You know, he was just walking around the park, playing with his gun, you know, shooting at random stuff. So, yeah, I mean, this area, as you are mentioning that the prosecutors just try to bully the, uh, the jury into not uh, proceeding with this uh, grand jury indictment. Uh, it's further proof in which, I guess, it's immense a case for jury notification on our end, right? Yeah. Because that's the same position that the prosecutor is. The prosecutor doesn't have to prosecute. The prosecutor doesn't have to take this to trial. They have a choice whether they want to go all the way or not. Uh, so that's an interesting balance then for people to take the nullification position themselves. Because a lot of people say, well, what do they say not guilty and it's really guilty? It's like the same thing as the prosecutor. The prosecutor does the same thing too. Knowing that it's not guilty, knowing there's not enough evidence, knowing that they have to make up stuff, they could easily not go to trial as well, right? So that's an interesting balance between the two. Uh, some areas in, which can be debatable, but that's another time to go into that. Uh, it's interesting because in this state you have open carry. I remember reading about this like uh, when somebody reported this kid and said, hey, um, there's this kid playing on the, on the playground that looks like a weapon. Might be a toy, I don't know. Telling this cop this, telling the operator this. The operator did not relay those two important facts that saying this is probably a kid, could be a toy gun. Yeah. Cop goes straight ahead, goes out there, mm -hmm. no questions asked. Uh, and a tax farm state in which is open carry, which is permissible, which is fine, uh, even if it's brandishing, as people say, well, he's brandishing, or are you trying to say that's the sentence then for brandishing a weapon is death? Murder? Right. Well, well, my question is, you know, if you, look at, if you look at the video, first of all, the cop just drives up right on the grass, right next to the kid. You know, I, I'm frankly almost surprised he didn't hit the kid. Mm -hmm. And it's within two seconds that he shows up and the kid's, in the, he's shot. He's probably thinking, and, so I'm going to get an award for this. Right, yeah. and, and they say that, the, that, that Tamir brandished the gun 
How, I don't even know how he could have done it in that amount of time. How is that even possible? Well, this this um, uh, this is interesting. So I agree with Cal on the nullification, the jury nullification. Um, that's that's a way to deal with these kind of situations. But there's really two things that I want to talk about when regards to specific case. Now, I haven't seen the video, so I'm going to take you at your word for everything you say about the video. Um, but one of the reasons I feel as though the political monopoly on law is the most dangerous state monopoly is because we have a situation where certain branches of government, certain agencies of government, can go to the government to deliberate their cases. So we've got a situation now where the state arbitrates disputes between us and each other, but also between us and them. So if you were to go to court with the cops, you're taking the government to court to the government. Which, you know, of course, how do you think that's going to turn yeah. out? So That is the stupidest trust that we can give somebody to prosecute themselves. And you, right? you look at these situations where, uh, okay, so people always people always say, well, you know, you can be, it's in the state's interest to find you guilty of every traffic citation you're going to get, yet a lot of people get off. Well, okay, insignificant circumstances in certain situations, well, you might have people disagree here and there within a heterogeneous organization like the state. But look at where there's conflict with the police. Look at where there's, there's conflicts where people say, well, they don't know the tax laws that they own. It's like, it's like 98% in favor of the state when the state takes itself to court with somebody else. You know, it's always going to be that way. It's, 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 it's part of the monopoly. And that's the second thing I want to get into was the monopolistic nature of the police. Well, what, what's going to happen now? Even if something happened to that particular cop, let's say he was indicted, uh, you still have a unilateral organization that preserves a monopoly on this particular service. Uh, so they, they are going to lose funding because their funding is taxed. It's, it's, it's taxed, so it's, it's expropriated. And um, they, it's not like they're going to ever go anywhere because that's a legislative matter, not a market matter. Right. Right. So those two things, I really think, just the fact that the government runs the place where you, you, you take the cops if you have an issue with them and the cops themselves, that's problematic. And that nobody can compete with the cops in any real way is also problematic. So I see that as an issue here, too. Yeah, the best you can do is pick off one or two, you know, right. quote unquote bad apples. And that will always be what they say, that it was a few bad apples. But it's it's not. And you can see videos that prove that. It's I've a, seen videos yeah. of of rampaging cops beating on somebody that's huddled on the ground. And every single cop, except for just a few, would just join in to beat the crap out of the, that kid for, mm -hmm. you know, when he's already clearly out of commission. It's a, it's a fundamental structural issue with the yeah. security system is what we have Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, it may have been a few bad apples 50 years ago, but it clearly isn't now. Because the incentives have accumulated to a point in which this is necessary now for them to do, you know. Uh, it, it, it's, it's... Um, well, it does, it, it if does it's draw easier, the worst If it's the worst. easier for people to, uh, to, for them to behave this way... Uh, then they're going to behave this way, and if there's no consequences for it other than public opinion, uh, which even still remains somewhat high, right, then right. Uh, it's not going to change anything. You need to have actual competition. You need to make it so they can go out of business. Oh, that's why they make it illegal and criminal to begin with, of course. All right. Uh, and they're not consumer-driven, so you can't even measure the effect of uh, how well they are. Right. The only way they can measure themselves in the, of their measured success is the number of people that they extort or hurt. Quotas. Or, right, quotas. Uh, the number, like Chesterfield, for example, has to have to kidnap two people, arrest two people, uh, per shift. What? Per shift. You have to kidnap two people per shift, and you have to pass out, I believe, like three to five extortion fines. That's uh, really ridiculous. I, I've heard of I've heard of traffic uh, citation quotas. I've never heard of arrest quotas. That's really despicable. Well, they don't have profit and loss, so they can't measure yeah. their success in any right. other way. And those quotas may or may not mean anything, too, you know? Mm -hmm. So what if, what if um, there's, so there's two ways that can go wrong. So what if you don't have two people in the shift for a given police officer that have done anything warranting of, a, of an arrest? And, or what if you have more people, you know? I mean, so both of these things would be solved in a market solution, but these right. quotas aren't going to do it. That's yeah, sure. and I absolutely agree. I mean, it's, it's as... As completely abhorrent as it is that they actually have this incentive system to go out and look for trouble, really, how else are you going to pick out the lazy ones? There, there is no other way to do it because there is no, you know, there is no invisible hand. There is no price mm -hmm. structure there. And they serve themselves at your ex expense, and they protect only their monopoly. It, it's it, it's um, a, a property expropriating property protector, which is both yeah. a, a, a contradiction <laughs> in terms and a conflict of interest. 
Yeah. No, yeah, I was, I was talking this uh, with Lawrence, uh, people trying to say like, like, well, there, there's some things that government can do good. It's like, well, you're talking about the same thing with cops as well. Um, and that, uh, you know, first you need to do evil in order to make the lying claim that you're here to do good. Mm -hmm. Right, first you need to steal from someone. Rob, all right, great. You saw a cop help an old lady cross the street. You didn't see what happened before that when she gave someone an extortion fund. When she arrested someone for a victimless crime, right? Uh, the, the proposition of that career field, that vocation involves in first initiating force. Who cares what kind of nice stuff they do outside of that, right? A thief is still a thief, all right? Yeah. Uh, kidnapper is still a kidnapper. Uh, and that's the vocation. Uh, they cannot uh, make the line claim of good otherwise without first doing evil. They, they have to do the exact same thing that they're technically supposed to prevent anybody else from doing. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> and, and that uh, brings up another question. Why were the cops there in the first place? You know, why were they harassing this child? And you know, I, I, think, I think you actually brought this up. I think there were, uh, uh, somebody was calling them about a child, and they actually specifically said that this might be a toy gun. And right. this, you know. That's the last thing you want to do. I mean, that's a death yeah. sentence. That's a murder call. If you call the cops on someone, you're pretty much saying, I'll call someone to come murder you, or right. kill you exactly. your dog. Yeah, and, and it's, it's shoot, shoot. because all, all the state knows how to do is escalate violence. That's all they are there to do. That's what they're founded on. That's what they exist on. Right. Right. And this is more proof in that. Well, yeah. I mean, the whole entire mentality of a cop is saying, I'm, this is uh, for your protection and mine. Right? It's mostly for their protection. They don't trust you. They look at everyone else as a potential threat. So it's nothing about seeing if we, uh, we're trying to eliminate potential threats around you. They see you as the potential threat to their life. Uh, whereas if I'm here for security, <laughs> your life is before mine. Right? That's where you're hiring me. Right? I'll take that bullet. I'll, I'll, I'll go in front of that. Right? Yeah, that's a good point. I never even thought about that. You're right. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I'm hiring a bodyguard, <laughs> what am I hiring you for? Yeah. To jump out of the way? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's an excellent point. It's entirely reversed. Uh, that's the mentality, and that's that's not security. That's well, there, not, it, yeah, it is clear. It, it has actually been established that cops have no legal uh, legal um, obligation. obligation to protect right. us. Right. And, you know, Unless they, you're detained, but yeah. Yeah. And anything happen? I'm not even sure yeah. about that. <laughs> but and they they similarly don't have to. They they can legally lie to you, but you cannot legally lie to them. Right. If you do it, it's yeah. perjury. If they do it, hey, I'm undercover. I'm yeah. investigating a case. Uh, a lot of double standards. I'll speak to people that don't do their jobs very well. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bernie Sanders just uh, made another interesting gaffe on uh, I think Twitter recently some social media. So he doesn't really understand why mortgage interest rates are lower than student loan rates. Bernie Sanders, the Democratic presidential candidate, recently revealed publicly, uh, I guess in the most obvious way as of yet, his misunderstanding of basic economics when he posted, quote, you have families out there paying six, eight, ten percent on student debt, but you can refinance your homes at three percent. What sense is that? All right, well, let me answer his question. <laughs> what sense is that? Well, here's, here's what the sense it is. So when, when you're, you're paying interest on a mortgage, the bank can repossess your house, but it's not like they can repossess your mind after you go to school. So what we call a mortgage is a secured loan, and what you'd call a student loan is an unsecured loan. All unsecured loans always, always, always have higher interest rates than secured loans. It, it just makes sense. And it actually scares me that there's a person like this who's that close to the White House um, who doesn't understand a, a concept is, is really, it's, it's 101 right there, what that yeah, is. Yeah. None of them understand it. <laughs> I know, but I mean, this, this is ridiculous. There's thing, somebody you know? in the White House that doesn't understand I it. understand, <laughs> but, uh, but th this is something that, this is unreal though. I, you know, I mean, there's, I, I, I think that they're all idiots, but this guy... <laughs> I think I saw a petition saying trying to get Bernie Sanders to read an economics book. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I signed it. On change.org, yeah. Well, I want to make sure one. he reads a good one, though. I don't want to read Dostoevsky oh, yeah. now. You know? <laughs> that, I don't think that counts. The general theory. I know they think that counts, but that doesn't yeah, count. Yeah, well, you know, economics versus religious fiction, you know, we can talk about right. that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was actually one of, one of my favorite comments to his tweet was uh, was something similar to that. He said, uh, the the bank can't repossess your mind, but you're you're starting to make me wonder. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's gonna, and I, I didn't really recognize him at first when it first came out, but I remember seeing an old video of him with uh, a Hanfield guy, Jan Hanfield. Mm -hmm. You ever seen that? Or he's trying to go to the Socratic method into having him reveal, you know, if you can't uh, delegate mm -hmm. some, a yeah. right to somebody, uh, what right do you have in terms of like stealing from them? 
And mm-hmm. it's like, well, because I were politicians and whatnot. And it's like, you're kind of going backwards here again. Uh, but that was him. That was Bernie Sanders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's been at this, uh, it's this scheming thing for, for decades now. And finally, he's on the spotlight. And he's like probably telling his wife, I told you, if I just keep talking nonsense, someone will pay attention to me. <laughs> he's like the guy in Mars Attacks, the general. It was like, if I just kept my mouth shut and didn't speak up, you know, eventually I'll have a position. And <laughs> he's the guy leading the armed forces mm-hmm. towards meeting the aliens. <laughs> That's who Bernie Sanders reminds me of. Um, he kind of reminds me of, I know I've probably seen this on Facebook before, he reminds me of um, that, that kid who would run for class president and promise like all day recess and stuff like that. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> That's him. Um, we're going to get back to Bernie Sanders' fallacies in a second. We're going to talk about the student loan bubble real quick. Yes. yes the um, so that's probably going to be the next bubble to pop. The um, next. Yeah, the next. By, by next, do you mean the current? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, it hasn't busted totally yet, but uh, uh, we have an artificially high demand for, for college education. We've got a lot of subsidies into those uh, right. students for their college education. Well, I mean, and, it's, it's currently, it's very inflated right now. Yeah, have you ever seen that Spongebob episode where... Um, they, I don't watch... Uh, well, TV. there's a great Spongebob episode where uh, they're trying not to get any paint on Mr. Krabs' uh, house um, or anything besides the walls. He's got all these knickknacks on the, on the wall. And uh, there's this huge bubble of paint that comes out of the paint can. SpongeBob's just a Patrick like, I don't think this bubble can get much bigger. Patrick goes, nonsense, he's inflating the bubble with like a bike pump or something like that. So that's kind of what's going That's what the government's doing right now to the student loan bubble. And there's a lot of reasons for this. So uh, demand is artificially high. Um, the value of a high school diploma is, is way lower than it really ought to be for what you have to do to, to get it, or at least the time you have to spend to get it. It's not really hard to get them at all. Uh, and then these subsidies cause prices to rise, because right. why would you lower prices if you can always get a high? Yeah, exactly. All right, there's no, there's, there's no cap on the market right. there. Um, so I think that's going to be a, be a problem here. So we're talking about things that Bernie Sanders says about student loans. We're also talking about the bubble behind me. Right. Yeah. That's another one. They want to know why VC tuitions are risen and risen, going higher and higher. Uh, they're guaranteed. When it's guaranteed, you know, that the college itself can just name its price. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's, that's that's really it. I mean, it, you know, they every single year the price jumps. Yeah. And you know, you can say, well, it's inflation, and yeah, a little it's bit of that much inflation every year. <laughs> that's jumping a heck of a lot more than inflation is yeah. raising the price. Actually, we had yeah. negative inflation in two thousand nine. We still had an intuition jump. Well, I did not realize we had negative inflation. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Not half a percent, but no. Yeah. Well, some... I I'm sorry, deflation. deflation. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, same term. Yeah. yeah. Another uh, quote by this guy. He says, uh, "Nobody can recall a Christmas Eve where the temperature was 65 degrees." Why is it that we're not effectively addressing climate change? You mean weather, right? Maybe he can't can't recall it because he's so damn old. But I mean. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Christmas temperatures in uh, Washington, D.C., 1964, 72 degrees, 1982, 70, 1965, 69, 1932, 68. And uh, we were talking about a temperature that was 65. So right. that's not anything we haven't seen before. What? Yeah. What? No, no, no. Not in my memory. Racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this, this guy, this guy. There's just nothing you can trust about this guy. Everything is just, just a sugar coating, just trying to put icing on everything that you want to hear. Uh, college for free. I remember somebody was talking about, like, what do you think about free college? I was like, it's not really free. I mean, you look at... Uh, There's no such thing as free college. I'm sorry. There is stolen college. Yeah, it's stolen. Well, yeah. And also, what the, I really think is important about that, I know it's not on our program, but um, uh, the United States has the highest graduation and college attendance rate of any country in the world. And the reason we have that is because there's a cost to it. Uh, so um, when if something even has a price, that means it's not abundant, mm-hmm. uh, which means not everybody can take as much as they want uh, whenever they want. So uh, all that making it free does is cause consumer prices to be zero, but that's going to cause more su- more demand than there is supply. So there's going to be rationing, and that rationing is usually not very intelligent, and it causes there to be even less of an attendance and a graduation rate than there is where there's a price to it. Right. And you can look at the uh, the rating of uh, German universities in which uh, they are free and they're rated among the lowest in the world, mm-hmm. uh, German universities. So yeah, you look at quality, that's what you get, shit quality with socialism. Um, and that's our future with Bernie Sanders, well, with any political ruler. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, something to keep in mind of. You know, there's, I think the race will continue what, until November, right? Mm-hmm. We have another whole year, this kind of madness. Well, they're going to, I think Bernie oh, Sanders is going to get kicked out. Um, <laughs> 
relatively soon because most of the election cycle next year is going to be between the Republican nominee and the Democratic nominee, right, right, right. and that's going to be so we know Hillary well, yeah, Clinton. I think I think the um, the uh, the primaries are actually in January, right? Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. So that'll be taking the we'll, we'll hear um, enough out of these people for, for most of that time. part is almost done. We'll see yeah. if Trump actually uh, becomes a Harris throw from the president. Hey, right. Donald <laughs> <I'm a> Trump, <laughs> man. That would be frightening. Anyway, that's a whole other episode right there. But. <laughs> so the next uh, uh, topic we're going to talk about is not a start, be, it's an audience question. This one's in related to the uh, relationship of uh, what well, if human beings can be enslaved in a free society can that continue to exist the question that's asked lots have been said in this video the previous video in which we were talking about animal rights uh, but i have two questions for you would human slavery be permissible in an anarchist society or does the nap make this unjust and immoral and if human slavery is immoral and unjust why is non-human slavery perfectly fine and so, I guess in a, in a free society, slavery, uh, these kind of violation of consent that uh, these monopolies of government have forced on everyone is abolished. Uh, now you have a free society that is based on consent. So the only way you could ever kind of use slavery in those kind of those terms and definitions is a sexual one, right? You can have your sex slave, your sex master, your BSM relationship. Um, and any time you give that consent, you can always retract that and, um, you know, it's like anything else. You have the freedom to give permission and withdraw permission over your, your body or any of your possessions. To clarify, we are speaking about S and M relationships and not actual sex slavery. Right, yeah. BDSM kinky relationship. Yeah. Make sure you have a safe word. Uh, <laughs> whereas today, when people vote and advocate for a political ruler, that's what you're doing. You're saying, this guy is my master. You're advocating for a weird kinky relationship that you want to force into everyone in a geographic region. I have a question. Yeah. So, um, typically when I think of ownership, I think something that somebody can do when they own something is sell it. Mm-hmm. So if you own yourself, couldn't you not sell yourself? So you can have a contract. I mean, like selling uh, my time and moving my arms at a, at a Chuck E. Cheese or a KFC, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm selling my labor and the condition that if I perform a certain set of actions, the title ownership of that money that we made a contractual agreement will be exchanged into my hands, right? Could, could, you, could you say, though, um, that... Until I die, I will do you know whatever these things are within for for no compensation. Could you you, you can say that as well. Yeah, uh, whatever the contract terms of those agreements so, are. Um, I have an argument um, against slavery in a free society um, based on um, I guess ontological purposes. So the way I understand things, each human being is able to exercise direct control over their own bodies. If you want to exercise control over somebody else's body, you can only do so indirectly. So that is to directly move your own body and then cause somebody else's body to move indirectly by exerting the necessary force in the necessary times, necessary places. So you'd have to acknowledge somebody else's direct control over their own body before you can acknowledge indirect control over theirs by you. Because if you don't, then you're engaging in some kind of contradiction because uh, you'd have to first use direct control over your own body to move theirs indirectly. So you have to presuppose everybody has the right to do this with their own body before you can make them do anything else with your own body. I agree with that statement, mm-hmm. uh, which is why we argue, which is another w- way of saying of uh, self-ownership in, in that uh, unacknowledgement sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, you would not argue with me. You'd punch right. me in the face, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with that as well. I think in this turn, someone's trying to say, like, if you can write a contract, but, you know, the thing is when you're contracting these kinds of services, these contracts also, you can cancel contracts. Right, you can. I could cancel my Netflix. Doesn't mean I'm enslaved to watching Netflix videos for the rest of my life, right? You because, probably are, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I mean, that's that's kind of what you find. Um, but then you can cancel and subscribe any time. You can draw up new contracts, uh, and of course, that's outlined in the, the terms of the agreements. No court is ever going to hold up that says, "Well, this uh, my boyfriend said he was going to take care of me for the rest of my life. Uh, he's going to love me." And then they break up, and then it's like, "Well, we're taking you to court." It's like you know, there, there's some things that just no one's going to take over into seriously because people can cancel and subscribe anytime. Otherwise, uh, there's, there's an interesting... Well, you say that, but there is a lot of alimony 
Right, and that sort of stuff exists under government law. That's mm-hmm. not a law that the husband himself agreed to. Yeah, try right. to and work. I guess that's not a jury situation. Either, so. Right, right. So you can have a rule so you get consent to any of those types of outlet. If you, if you want to be crazy enough to sign it, go for it. But the ones under today in terms of outlet money, you never gave consent to those laws, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, trying to find these kind of um, disputes outside of law is something new that we should kind of practice and figure out today. Um, so in, in that case, yeah, you, you can't have it. Uh, so no, human slavery cannot exist in a, in a free society because anyone can cancel and subscribe, right? That's what a free society is about. So if you're interested in that, great, have a safe word and have fun with that. Uh, I think the other question was talking about if it's wrong and immoral, then uh, why can't non-humans, um, why is that wrong for non-humans, like animals, right? But again, I would say that you're anthropomorphizing that relationship that we have with other humans I guess the force and violent ones in terms of um, saying that you can have the same thing with cats um, or other animals, right? Can I also put something? So um, when we talk about what's right and wrong, the question only arises because we can uh, have some kind of dispute or verbal argumentation over that question. So you can't have um, morals being talked about between cats and dogs because they're not capable of doing that. So you need, uh, you need some method of argumentation in order to uh, even arrive at conclusions. So when you have an animal that can't even arrive, take that question into consideration, then it's um, a different situation than people who can actually bring about that question and resolve it through argumentation. Right. So actually, um, that, that, that's actually a different way of um, approaching that specific argument than, than what I heard last, last time around. And uh, that brings it into actually a completely species-oriented area. Mm -hmm. And describing it that way, I actually applaud you for because that is actually, that is the answer to why can't in the uh, askers or in the questioners wording, why can we, you know, eat animals and not retards or however? Well, that actually it will fall under that because uh, babies can't argue. Right, but you. but if you if you word it in, in the way that that you worded it specifically, mm-hmm. puts that into a species realm and right. into the the realm of the species, not into just the individual itself. Right, but you can't do it as if like the baby has a potential to argue itself. You can't argue from potentiality because the acorn is not a tree. Uh, a zygote is not. But a, also, um, we're talking about human slavery here. Uh, a human that isn't adept enough to uh, make an argument for itself uh, also can't perform slave tasks. Either babies can't do right. these kinds of things. Anyway. Right. Well, I guess yeah, that that makes that somewhat a, a moot question. Right. I, I would say I'm a species myself, uh, and in most of the sense, mm-hmm. and rules based, and there's a lot of stuff that you can kind of overlay. Well, for me, a lot of it. I mean, you get this argument from from animal rights activists saying things like, "Well." You know, animals would be doing that. We're no different from animals right. if we're. And to me, that's that's completely contradictory because if you say, "Well, we're not different, any different than animals," so how can we do that? Well, an animal would sure, sure as hell, go after me if it was a an issue of, "Oh, I'm hungry" or whatever. So saying, therefore, that we have the moral agency to not do that to them is contradicting your statement that we are not superior argument yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that that itself is a contradictory argument right right and that can just be brushed aside yeah (laughs) as we have done (laughs) uh let me see what else we have here i mean in terms of enslaving that's something that animals could do you can say they cast themselves or enslaving their owners all the time right you have to go to work or your pet dog for example you bring the food in and the dog likes to sleep around all day and, and Use you, exploit you. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, man, I'm a slave to my dog. Right? It's true. <laughs> Free of this barbarism. <laughs> uh, and I guess the last part here was uh, talk about, yeah, what about new ba- newborn babies? You know, without more agency, can they be actively killed in this situation without any problem? Um, and I guess this was in terms in regards to uh, if there's no ownership for the baby. So say that someone was had a baby... Uh, and there's and the person died. There's no one around to take care of the baby. Can you then just kill the baby? But the thing is, uh, I was like, well, you know, Mm-mm. right? Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, uh, because you, in order to kill the baby, you'd have to, like I mentioned before, exercise direct control over your body to deprive them of direct control over theirs. In other words, prioritize indirect control over direct control while using direct control to do that. 
So it's a contradictory thing to do when to, to, to physically harm somebody else that way. But that's as a specious position, right? Uh, and, I mean, no, I think it's just a logical position. But oh. then you can say, then why, what is the difference then from doing that to another animal then? Why can't you? Why can't you what? Do the same thing controlling another animal, that the baby has the same kind of responses as a regular animal. The baby doesn't have more agency, the baby's uh, in the first couple well, of Well, yeah, months. it is in that respect, it is species. Yes. Right, right. So that point, yeah, I and mean, we can't be species. What's wrong with that, right? Human beings over everyone else, right? I'm tired of the whole thing is like, well, we have to save this animal, or like these, like government does all the time. We gotta save this turtle at the expense of everyone else, right? At the expense of you trying to have land there, we'll shoot you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, which, which animal do you value more, this turtle over a human being, right? And so I think um, that kind That's of exactly negative, what the EPA does, right? I think that negative interaction that we've, we've come face to face and, and throughout the many years here under these tax farms is why a lot of people think, well, have taken that position uh, without really first to re-end the violence we do to each other, abolish the state, abolish government, abolish uh, violent parenting through that extent. So alone, we come to better care of our environment, of each other, of animals. Uh, you won't have these Monsanto farms. You won't have these We have a video on that too, I think. Yeah, yeah we do, yeah. <laughs> it's a while ago. Uh, so the last part here, the last question, so what's the criterion to decide when an animal, human or not, can own himself and have the national aggression principle applied to him? I guess that goes to the, what you're putting forth. Um, and that's something I guess you also want to consider in terms of uh, aliens, right? Uh, the, a great thing to have if, when you're encountering another life form is to see if you can argue with that life form, to see if you can engage some kind of discourse, because that will put some kind of prejudices, some mm -hmm. assumptions of self ownership, and vice versa. Well, that that comes down to so you, you have to have communicability, and whether that communicability is present, it you know does not is not the issue here. It is if that intellectual communicability exists. Mm -hmm. And if we can, if there is a way to communicate with an alien race, then you must respect that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, similarly, if an alien race finds its way over here, you know, or we find them making tools and being able to, to you know, build a community and whatnot, then you have to respect that. You have to, you know, you have to respect their ability to communicate values and morality amongst themselves at the very least. Right. And the future possibility of them communicating that to you once, you know. Right. If they can conceptualize that part. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, because the thing about, like, there's some gorillas that can do sign language, but the thing is, how do I know if they're just mimicking, right? Mm -hmm. Emotions. So do they really understand what's going on in terms of that? Can they conceptualize new words, right? Can they create new definitions? But no, it seems like they can't. The only thing they can do is just copy and mimic uh, for their own survival basic instincts. Uh, it doesn't really seem much more than that. But if they could, if there's a gorilla that could sign language and create their own words and their own language, at that point, it's like, yeah, I think yeah. they kind of crossed that threshold. Right. Yeah. Um, I agree. So, uh, yeah, good. Uh, good summary of that. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, hopefully, if uh, that that satisfies uh, the audience question, if you guys have any questions about any topic uh, you'd like us for, to go over, uh, let us know. Put it in the comments below. And with that, I'm Cal Moloney. I'm Phil Pollard. Matt Adamioli. See you guys at Victory Party, and have a good New Year's. Well, 